Hello and welcome to Kimnal Bay's daily vlog, the fourth in our series on the prophets. Did you ever hear the tale of Jonah and the whale way down in the middle of the ocean? I can see some of you nodding and smiling. How did he get there? Whatever did he wear? Way down in the middle of the ocean. Well, this reminds me of Eric, who's always seeking out reports of what's been found in whale stomachs and the old and new stories of people who have survived being swallowed by a whale. There's a brilliant 2016 video on YouTube about someone surviving this, but I digress. digress. A preaching he should be in Nineveh, you see. He disobeyed a very foolish notion. Ah, oh, we're getting somewhere. But God forgave his sin and made him clean within, way down in the middle of the ocean. Our journey through the Essential 100 has shown us that forgiveness, righteousness and salvation are all key themes of the story of God and mankind. And they hint that there's much more to the prophet Jonah than just surviving an ordeal in the whale's tummy. So before we go any further, let's pray. Oh Lord, help me to step out of my hectic life and enter into your calm presence. May I be quiet so that my mind and heart can take in the things that you know I need to hear and that I might be blessed today. Amen. The notes for today's uh, four chapters of the book of Jonah um, tell us that uh, we can think of the book as a four act play. In the first act, Jonah is running away. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying his fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each called out to his own God. And we know that the result is that Jonah gets thrown over, uh, and ends up in the tummy of the big fish. So act two is praying. In my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From the depths of the grave, I called for help and you listened to my cry. The whale eventually spits Jonah up. And we now get act three obeying. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to that great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. And the Ninevites repent. And we get act four, sulking. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. So we see that this book of Jonah is not exactly typical of the book of the prophets. It's a period of, the, of Jonah's life. It's told to us in the third person and has only one verse of actual prophecy. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. Martin Luther described Jonah as a strange and odd saint who was angry with God for his mercy on sinners. And yet he is God's dear child. He chats uninhibitedly with God, as though he were not in the least afraid of him, as indeed he's not. 
he confides in God as father. So do we know anything more of Jonah other than what we read in his prophetic book? 2 Kings 14 verse 25 tells us that he was a prophet during the reign of Jeroboam II, 783 to 743 BC, the last great king of the northern tribes of Israel. Although Jeroboam was politically very successful, as Jonah prophesied, we are told that he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And so it's no surprise that a mere 20 years after his death, Israel was completely destroyed by Tiglath-Pileser III of Assyria, whose capital was Nineveh. Jonah, in his book of the prophet, is called to preach against the city because, God says, its wickedness has come up before me. Jonah is not a reluctant prophet in the same way others in the Bible are. Just two days ago, Joseph introduced us to Jeremiah, a reluctant prophet. But his reluctance was because of his age and lack of training. But like many giants of the Old Testament, Jeremiah enters into conversation with God and is given assurance and strength. Jonah says nothing. He just runs. And it's not until the end of the story that we find out why Jonah run. Jonah receives a second call after the whale spat him up and he prophesied over Nineveh. And when he does so, the king and all his people turned from their evil ways. God had compassion on them and did not destroy them. And it is this that displeases Jonah and makes him angrily pray, saying that he knew it would happen. And so that's why he ran away. Now these wicked people are forgiven, he might as well die. Jonah is sort of tying himself up in a theological knot. He knows God is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love and relenting in sending calamity. He just doesn't want to see God display these wonderful attributes to the sort of people who live in Nineveh. Later on, Jesus would encounter the same attitude from the Jews. They said, why does this man eat with tax collectors and sinners? This sort of attitude displays that the person holding it has decided who should be in or out of God's favour. In other words, they've crossed a line in their own understanding and created some boundaries for God's grace and mercy. Such a person wants to say who should be in or out of heaven telling God that he could never forgive such a crime. But who can say this? God says to Jonah, should I not be concerned about the great city? And Jesus says to the Jews, it's not the healthy who need a doc doctor, but the sick. I have come to call the right, not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. In the book of Jonah, we're reintroduced to the truth we first met in Genesis 15, that through Abram, all the nations of the world would be blessed, including Nineveh. We would do well not to try and make up rules for God as to who he can or cannot save. Such an action is to make a God in our own image and a God like this is no good to man nor beast. Let's rather rejoice that sometimes God's ways are beyond our ways, but not always he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And when faced with the question, who can be saved? He answers it like this in John 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus, a pardon receives. Let's end on that wonderful note and go on into our day praising the Lord as the hymn does. So take care. God bless. Bye.